should be. But tonight we go back into spiritual authority. In a quick recap of what we covered so far, we've done four messages. This is five. First, we examined the importance of authority, looked at how all authority is established by God in Romans 13, 1 through 7, how God's throne and God's power are established on his authority in Hebrews 1, 3. After the importance of authority, we examined rebellion in the Old Testament, first with Adam and Eve, then Nadab and Abihu, who were sons of Aaron, then Miriam and Aaron, then the, then the entire congregation of Israel got it into their head to rebel. I'm going to go ahead and give you the short of it. Didn't work well. In each instance, the rebellion that was exhibited as disobedience came from a lack of understanding or a lack of teaching regarding authority. Just as, the, just as at the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, according to Jesus in Matthew 12, 24, any disobedient action is born out of a rebellious heart. And after we looked at Old Testament rebellion, we looked at obedience in the Old and New Testaments by way of King David and Jesus. They understood obedience and submission to authority. We saw how David knew how to respect any who were the Lord's anointed, and he didn't kill Saul when he had multiple opportunities, and Saul took many opportunities to try to kill him, and he still didn't do it. In Jesus' life and his death, uh, obedience was established to God's authority since the angels and humanity had both previously rebelled against God. After Jesus was resurrected, God the Father made Jesus Lord over all and filled him with everything he gave up to become a human, even fuller than he was when he left. We've looked into how God uses his authority to establish his kingdom. That was part four. And tonight, we're going to explore obeying delegated authorities for you and I in three distinct areas, in the world, in the family, and in the church. We're going to start in the world. And we're going to go back to what would, you could probably call the theme verse for this entire series. It's Romans 13.1. And again, I always use the Amplified Classic Edition for these. Let every person be loyally subject to the governing civil authorities, for there is no authority except from God by his permission, his sanction, and those that exist do so by God's appointment. 1 Peter 2, 13 and 14 says, Be submissive to every human institution and authority for the sake of the Lord whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to bring vengeance or punishment or justice to those who do wrong and encourage those who do good, and to encourage those who do good service there is no new information here god is the source of all authority everywhere the term for being put into being put into authority by by a higher a higher authority i'm apparently under-caffeinated, is to be delegated. Another thought about it is for them being a representative authority because the big boss is away, the big boss is out on other business, so they have put this person, and because I'm speaking to y'all wonderful people, I'm going to say that he's put you in charge of something. This would make you a manager of some sort. I don't know what your specific title would be in the instance that you're framed up in your head, but that's what we're going with. It is, and this system was established by God. Now, it is possible to meet an authority without meeting their physical presence. Back in olden times when there were kings, things were done in the name of the king. If someone broke a law, they might be killed in the name of the king, but they were never given the option to see the king or queen, as the case may be, in person. But things were still being done under their power. And for us, that could mean things are being done by executive order of the president. And you may not ever get the opportunity to meet the president in person, but his authority is still going out and still being used to establish what he said needs to be done. For example, after they'd been kicked out of the garden, Adam and Eve still had God's authority. They still had access to God's authority even though they were denied his presence. And in the New Testament, there's a wonderful parable about it. Uh, the parable of the workers in the vineyard in Mark 12, 1 through 9. 
And a lot of what we talk about this evening is going to hearten back to this. And Jesus started to speak to them in parables, with comparisons and illustrations. A man planted a vineyard and put a hedge around it, and dug a pit for the wine press and built a tower and let it out for rent to vine dressers, and went into another country. When the season came, he sent a bondservant to the tenants to collect from them some of the fruit of the vineyard. But they took him and beat him and sent him away without anything. Again, he, being the owner, sent to them another bondservant, and they stoned him and wounded him in the head and treated him shamefully, sending him away with insults. And he sent another, and that one they killed. Then many others, some they beat, some they put to death. He still had one left to send, a beloved son. Last of all, he sent, to, he sent him to them, saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, here's the heir, come on, let us put him to death, and then the inheritance will be ours. I don't know why they sounded like pirates, but they did. And they took him and killed him and threw his body outside the vineyard. Now what will the owner of the vineyard do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. This parable appears in other gospels, and it's properly known as the parable of the wicked husbandman or the parable of the bad tenants. Now, I had to Google what wicked husbandmen meant, but that's for another time. It has to do with the fact that they were farmers. In it, we see that the owner of the vineyard set it up to be the best that it could possibly be. He spent time and money planting a hedge all the way around the vineyard for protection, protection from the elements, protection from other people, He dug a pit uh, for the wine press so that they could continue to profit from the fruits of their labor, making and selling wine. And he built a habitation for the tenants to live in, a tower for them to rent. Now, even though the owner of the vineyard was out of the country, he was still the owner. Those who had agreed to rent from him would not listen to the people he sent to collect his portion of the crop. Eventually, all the tenants had even, killed, had even killed his own son, so the owner saw fit to give the vineyard to others and destroy the tenants. The, tenden, the tenants would have required the physical presence of the owner to obey their authority. Instead, the... the the tenants would have required... I know, it's so bad today. <gasps> there, I, I breathed. Does that work? That'll sound great on the audio. <laughs> now, what the tenants wanted, what the tenants re would have required was the physical presence of the owner to listen to the owner's authority. But instead of doing that, the owner sent other people that he had invested his authority in. Now, while we could delve into the symbolism in this parable, parable, where God the Father is very clearly the owner, the tenants are the Israelites in the Old Testament, at least by my understanding of it, and the bondservants were God's chosen authorities in the Old Testament, the kings and the judges and the prophets and the priests and the, all those people that the tenants, you know, would kill and beat up and drive out and insult and take wonderful care of. In, and so now, after and now, God talks about how, or it shows how Jesus was the owner's son. They put him to death. And so God, the owner, saw fit to let it out to the others, or the Gentiles. Yay for us. Because I don't know about y'all, but I'm not Jewish. <laughs> Instead, we, we, what we'll look at is how God's authority rested on his bondservants and how the tenants rejected all measures of delegated authority sent by the owner. Now today, people will reject all kinds of delegated authorities. We suffer the delusion that God's work is not at hand when we think a, part a particular ruler is wicked or ungodly. And that, and that we then do not have to be subject to their authority. If we don't agree with our boss, our boss's boss, the local cops, state laws, 
federal laws, people in other miscellaneous positions of authority, we rebel and choose not to follow the law. Speeding has been my favorite example throughout this sermon series because it is so relevant to many, myself very much included. I've been better. I've been getting better. I love the looks of trust I'm getting. But Romans 13.1 tells us that all authority starts with God and is delegated from there. You and I will only come into contact with a delegated authority unless we have a personal encounter with God the way that Saul did on the Damascus Road. And when Adam was in the garden, he was given dominion over all the living creatures on the earth. And after the flood, man was given authority to govern other men in Genesis 9.6. I'm going into this because some people would think that the established human government is only human, that it didn't generate from God, but in fact, it did. In Genesis 9, 6, God says, "Whoever sh or it's Noah, I think, who might be speaking, whoever sheds man's blood, by man shall his blood be shed. No, this is God talking. For in the image of God, he made man. In this statement, God created human government by giving men the authority to rule over other men. Now, familial authority was still there. The husband was still over the wife and the wife over the children, and that's something that we're going to get to. But this gave men the authority to govern of, over people that they were not related to based on the authority that God had given them. After the exodus from Egypt, God gave the Ten Commandments and many other ordinances. I'm not going to go through all of those, but we are going to look at Exodus 22:28 which says, you shall not revile God, the judges, as his agents, or esteem lightly or curse a ruler of your people. God doubled down on his, be on his people being under human authority. Not that Gentiles weren't subject to authority too, by the way. The king of Persia was shown ha to have been set up by God in the first chapter of the book of Ezra, in the same manner that King David and King Solomon were set up by God. Now, when Jesus was on the earth, as we have covered previously, he was subject to all the authorities and exhibited perfect obedience and perfect submission through his entire life. Even when he was being questioned by the high priests during his trial, he was, he was obedient and submissive. Now, I, I didn't include those verses because they're examples that we've covered before. And even as evil waxes worse and worse as the day of the Lord approaches, it is the job of the church to be obedient and submissive to all authorities unless their direction directly, unless their direction violates the word of God. That is the only out that there is. Subjection to worldly authorities is shown in four ways. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Revenue to whom revenue is due, respect to whom respect is due, and honor to whom honor is due. And there are, and the humanity in us, the flesh in us, bucks against those things. I don't happen to like having to pay taxes, but I gladly do it because it serves valuable purposes, and God tells me I should. I pay the people who I say I'm going to pay because they are due the revenue. I give honor to people in position of authority. I give honor to everybody because God says to. I don't have the verse for it, but trust me, it's in there. And I give respect to whom respect is due because everyone, everyone is who we are meant to be servants to. In 2 Peter 2.10, he says, and particularly those who walk after the flesh and indulge in the lust of polluting passion and scorn and despise authority, presumptuous and daring, self-willed and self-loving creatures. They scoff, at, they scoff at and revile dignitaries, glorious ones, without trembling. That's not the description of the people inside the church. Those are for the people who walk after the flesh and indulge in those lusts. But we as Christians we follow the leading of the Holy Spirit living in us, and we walk according to the Spirit. We shouldn't let those things be able to be said about us, scoffing and reviling at dignitaries without trembling, without an understanding of the power that sits in them. Now, we don't need to worry 
about how God will handle those who institute things that are done for unrighteous purpose. But we should pray for mercy on them and that their heart would turn to God. The better question is that when lawlessness is at work, are we acting as a restraint or a help to their lawlessness? We're going to jump on to section two because I have a lot more notes and not a lot of time. This is talking about the family. And uh, before I get into this too deeply, let it be known that the husband is meant to be the head of the family just like how Christ is the head of the church. As such, the husband is accountable to God for the way that he leads his family or fails to do so. A lot of male authors and a lot of male preachers I've seen talk about how the wife is supposed to be submitted to the husband and they do very little to show the responsibilities of the husband inside the household. The husband is supposed to be the spiritual head. The husband is supposed to be the protector and the provider. And if he is not those things, he is answerable to God for the way that they act. Training their children in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord and being a servant to his wife also fall into the responsibilities of a godly husband. Don't let the scriptures that are used a little bit after here, think you make you think that husbands get off scot-free in the roles and responsibilities of the family. They're just different. Ephesians 5, through 25 in the Amplified says, Wives, be submissive and adapt yourselves to your own husbands as a service to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, himself the savior of his body. As the church is subject to Christ, so let wives also be subject to everything, in everything to their husbands. Husbands, love your wives, as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Ephesians 6, 1 through 3 says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord as his representatives, for this is just and right. Honor, that is, esteem and value as precious your father and your mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that all may be well with you and that you may live long on the earth. Colossians verses, chapter 3, verses 18, 20, and 22. Wives, be subject to your husbands, subordinate, and adapt yourselves to them as is right and fitting and your proper duty in the Lord. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this is pleasing to the Lord. Servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not only when their eyes are on you as pleasers of men, but in simplicity of purpose with all your heart, because of your reverence for the Lord and as a sincere expression of your devotion to him. God's authority in the home is discussed in many New Testament epistles. Ephesians, Colossians, 1 Timothy, Titus, and 1 Peter, to name a few. The husband is God's delegated authority in the home. If the rest of the family realizes that and the husband acts how he ought to act, many of the problems in the home could disappear. I grew up in a home, and I have, I have evidence right here and secondary evidence right there, that growing up, dad's word was law. That was it. Couldn't argue. Well, you could argue, but you're wasting your breath. Yeah, that, that was the line. This isn't up for discussion. I have told you, you now know what to do. Go and do it. And that is as much a testament to my mother's walk with God as it is my father's understanding of authority. Because my father, lovely man that he is, may not have always been the easiest to live with. And because, I'm trying to be nice, Kathy. <laughs> And because my mother has a deep, deep relationship with the Lord, she understood what her job as a wife was to do. Now, it doesn't mean that things wouldn't be up for discussion between them in private, but it meant that she gave him honor and she respected him in every possible way that she could. And he did the same. It might have taken him a minute to realize when he hadn't, but he always apologized and he always corrected but in many homes, this relationship is not the case. So it's discussed how a married man or woman who is a Christian should conduct themselves with their Christian spouse as much as with their unbelieving spouse 
And again, Christian wives are specifically mentioned. It's 1 Peter 3.1. In like manner, you married women, be submissive to your own husbands, subordinate yourselves as being secondary to and dependent upon them, and adapt yourselves to them, so that even if any do not obey the word of God, they may be won over, not by discussion, but by the godly lives of their wives. A godly wife is a living, breathing testament to an unbelieving husband, and vice versa. In 1 Peter 3, 5 through 6, he says, For it was thus that the pious women of old, who hoped in God, were accustomed to beautify themselves and were submissive to their husbands, adapting themselves to them as them." Yeah, adapting themselves to them as themselves, secondary and dependent upon them. It was thus that Sarah obeyed Adam, following or Abraham, following his guidance and acknowledging his headship over her by calling him Lord, Master, Authority. And you are now her true daughters if you do right and let nothing terrify, terrify you, not giving way to hysterical fears or letting anxieties unnerve you. Women are inherently more caring than men in many of the instances when I have known a man and a woman. Because of that, and some people more so than others based on their past, anxiety and worry becomes this all-inclusive thing that cannot be escaped. But Peter here says, let nothing terrify you. Again, this is assuming that the husband is acting as he is meant to do. The wife shouldn't worry about the things that are going on because it's the husband's job to take care of it. Sarah didn't worry about what was going on because she understood that Abraham was doing his job and taking care of whatever was going on, whatever situation they were in, even when Abraham acted stupid and lied a few times, as he did. We never see that Sarah worried about it because it was Abraham's job and Abraham's responsibility to provide and protect for his family. And I'm not advocating that women call their men Lord because that just feels weird. (laughs) It just won't work. Too many guys are going to get off on a power trip if that happens. We don't need that. (laughs) But Sarah's obedience to Adam, Abraham, I don't know why I keep saying Adam, good bloody night. Her obedience to Abraham was as integral to their conception of Isaac as Abraham's obedience to God. And so from Genesis, God instituted that the husband was meant to be the head of the household. If we look back at Ephesians 6, 2, and 3, it's a quote from the Ten Commandments, and it was the first to come with a promise. If we teach our children how to obey, how God's authority is present at a young age, their seeing it as an adult would be much easier because they're constantly aware of it. In Ephesians 6, 5 through 7, Paul writes, Servants, which are slaves, be obedient to those who are your physical masters, having respect for them and eager concern to please them, in singleness of motive and with all your heart, as service to Christ himself, not in the way of eye service, as if they were watching you, and only to please them, but as servants or slaves of Christ, doing the will of God heartily and with your whole soul, rendering service readily with good will as to the Lord and not to men. In 1 Timothy 6, 1, he writes, let all, who are under, let all who are under the yoke as bondservants esteem their own personal masters worthy of honor and fullest respect so that the name of God and the teaching about him may not be brought into disrepute and blasphemed. And in Titus 2, 9 through 10, tell bondservants to be submissive to their masters, to be pleasing and give satisfaction in every way. Warn them not to talk back or contradict, nor to steal by taking things of small value, but to prove themselves truly loyal and entirely reliable and faithful throughout, so that in everything they may be an ornament and do credit to the teaching which is from and about God our Savior. The Bible recognizes that servants and even slaves in a household or in a workplace are as important as any family member living at a home. I know these verses talk about how subordinates should treat those in authority, but you should know that there are just as many verses where masters are told how to treat those who they are over authority. 
When this was written, slavery was at its worst in the Roman Empire. And it's very likely that a fair number of Christians would have been in the role of a household servant or slave. Now, this doesn't question the morality of slavery, because we know that, or we, yes, we know that slavery is wrong. It is wrong to own another human being. But for the humans who are Christians, who are in that role, or for the humans or for the Christians who own people, because that problem wasn't very far ago in this country, the Bible gives specific and clear instructions on how to conduct yourself. You follow the authority, not just because they're your authority, but because God's authority is on them. And if you try, and if I, if I work for Jonathan, and there are days when it feels like I do, if I'm working for Jonathan, and I only do the right thing when he's right in front of me, just like those tenants, if I'm only doing the right thing, and I'm calling myself a Christian, if I'm only doing the right thing when he is in sight and in mind, and then I try to talk to him about God, he's not going to listen to me. Because he knows that I'm not walking my talk. And God wants us to walk our talk. We are doers of the word, not hearers only. So again, the morality of slavery isn't the question here. It's if you're in that situation, how do you properly conduct yourself? And we're all servants to something. We're servants to our bosses, for those of us who aren't retired. We're servants to the, to the people in our family who are older than us. And we're to be subject to those authorities. And I would say especially if they're non-believers. Because your good works and your heart are going to show through to them and make them more malleable and more receptive to the word of God when they hear it. But we are on the final turn. We're on to part three of this where we're talking about authority in the church. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 through 13, <laughs> now also we beseech you, brethren, get to know those who labor among you. Recognize them for what they are. Acknowledge and appreciate and respect them all. Your leaders who are over you in the Lord and those who warn and kindly reprove and exhort you. And hold them in very high and most affectionate esteem in intelligent and sympathetic appreciation of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. First Timothy 5.17 says, Let the elders who perform the duties of their office well, who do their office well, be considered doubly worthy of honor and of adequate financial support, especially those who labor faithfully in preaching and teaching. 1 Corinthians 16, 15 and 16 says, Now, brethren, you know that the household of Stephanus were the first converts and our first fruits in Achaia, which is most of Greece, and how they have consecrated and devoted themselves to the service of the saints, God's people. I urge you to pay all deference to such leaders and to enlist under them and be subject to them, as well as to everyone who joins and cooperates with you and labors earnestly. God has set up a church government and a hierarchy in the church, just like in the home and just like in the wide world. These elders and leaders in the body are God's delegated authorities inside the church. Paul had a great understanding of God's government within the church. It probably helped that he started out as an Israelite, as a Pharisee, as a very learned Pharisee. In his letters to Timothy, he discusses the qualifications for leaders within the church in great detail. These leaders are largely men, and it isn't because women have no value, by the way. At Heart of God, we have women in charge of Kingdom Kids, Little Lamb, the Nursery Loaves and Fishes, and many other ministries that I couldn't think of off the top of my head. Paul addresses women in the church in 1 Corinthians 11. Now this, this gets a little Barbie. Thorny, not barbecuey. Sorry. This gets a little thorny. Because 
people have taken the words that Paul wrote and they take them as true and as literal. But like we're going to see in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, he says, consider for yourselves. He doesn't call it law. He doesn't call it a word of the Lord. He gives his understanding and his opinion. And there is a distinct possibility that in the 2,000-ish years between Paul's writing in the first letter to Corinthians and today, that social values might have changed slightly. A little. I'm not advocating that people dress immodestly, male or female, because that doesn't give God honor, not in my opinion. I am not advocating that people never ever cut their hair. We had a visiting missionary from Finland, Jor Hogland, and he talked about how some of the women there were Presbyterian when he was growing up, and I think he called them holy rollers because they never cut their hair. And they would be rolled, if they unrolled it, it'd be in these great big rolls, look like Princess Leia cinnamon buns. Be great big rolls, and if they ever let it out, it would be all the way down. They'd never even had a trim. Because they took the word so literally that said a woman shouldn't cut their hair. I happen to be married to a hairdresser. It is healthy for your hair to be cut at a certain point. Even I know that. But getting back to 1 Corinthians 11, we're going to be, or I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 11, 3. Paul writes, but I want you to know and realize that Christ is the head of every man. The head of a woman is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Again, looking at the authority in every situation. In 1 Corinthians 11, verses 10 through 13, he says, therefore, she, a woman, should be subject to his authority and should have a covering on her head as a token, a symbol of her submission to authority, that she may show reverence as do the angels and not displease them. Nevertheless, in the plan of the Lord and from his point of view, woman is not apart from and independent of man, nor is man aloof from and independent of woman. <laughs> For as woman was made from man, even so man is also born of woman, and all, whether male or female, go forth from God as their author. Consider for yourselves, is it proper and decent according to your customs for a woman to offer prayer to God publicly with her head uncovered? And it goes on and it goes on. I'm not going to read that whole thing because I don't need the angry talks after. I covered as much of it as I cared to cover. And I've covered myself by saying and pointing out and reiterating in verse 13 that he says, consider for yourselves. Some of Paul's statements do rather rub us wrong. But again, you know, that 2,000-ish years thing, I'm going to fall back on that. And in all things, however, we should have balance. We judge those things for ourselves. And I encourage the growth of any, of any person in the ministry, male or female, because there are people who, will not, who think it is wrong to allow a woman behind a pulpit. I rather disagree. I'm all for anyone getting into the ministry. So long as they're being led, guided, and directed by the Holy Spirit, I don't. And they choose to follow that. I don't really care. 1 Peter 5.5, 5, moving swiftly along to save myself some dignity. He says, Likewise, you who are younger and of lesser rank, be subject to the elders, the ministers and spiritual guides of the church, giving them due respect and yielding to their counsel. Clothe or apron yourselves, all of you, with humility, as the garb of a servant, so that its covering cannot possibly be stripped from you, with the freedom from pride and arrogance toward one another. For God sets himself against the proud, the insolent, the overbearing, the disdainful, the presumptuous, or the boastful, whichever term you prefer to use. And he opposes, frustrates, and defeats them, but gives grace, favor, and blessing to the humble. This is part of what makes people rebel against authority, especially in the church. This is directed towards the church, but it applies just as well as the, in the home and in the, world, in the world. If leaders are servants not putting themselves on a pedestal, it makes us want to submit and obey. Even the angels have a hierarchy of authority. 
1 Peter 2, 10 through 11. I covered verse 10 before, but we're adding a verse. And particularly those who walked after the flesh and indulge in the lust of polluting passion and scorn and despise authority, presumptuous and daring, self-willed and self-loving creatures, they scoff at and revile dignitaries, glorious ones, without trembling. Whereas even angels, though superior in might and power, do not bring a defaming charge against them before the Lord. And Jude, verse 9, says, but we've talked about this before, but it bears repeating. But even when, but when even the archangel Michael, contending with the devil, over the bones of Moses, by the way, argue, judicially argued, disputed about the body of Moses, he dared not presume to bring an abusive condemnation against him, but simply said, the Lord rebuke you. Before he fell, Satan was in authority over the archangel Michael. And similarly, to how King David refused to be rebellious to King Saul after Saul had been rejected by the Lord and King David had been anointed the future king of Israel, here the archangel Michael refuses to speak against Satan. In the New Testament, there was a council in Acts 15 where everyone could share their opinion on whatever the matter at hand was. Peter and Paul were among those who spoke at the council but James made the judgment. The apostles and elders of the first church had an order that was put in place by God, and it's the job of those in leadership in the church to know where they stand in the hierarchy. This is why Paul says what he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 9. He says, for I am the least worthy of the apostles who am not fit or deserving to be called an apostle because I once wronged and pursued and molested the church of God, oppressing it with cruelty and violence. Paul knew where he was in the hierarchy of the church. Peter knew where he was in the hierarchy of the church. Even though Peter, Jesus told, Jesus told Peter that he would be the start of the church. If you look in Catholicism, Peter is the first pope. But they knew at that council that they, were, that they could say whatever they wanted, but the final judgment came down to James because James was the person in authority for that meeting. And they deferred to him. Paul only wrote, what is it, two-thirds of the New Testament. Peter was told by Jesus that he would start the church. But they understood when to stand down, and they understood when they were not the person at the helm. God has taken a risk in instituting authorities. Being that he's God, I'm going to assume it is a risk he calculated and saw worthwhile. He's omniscient and omnipotent, so he knows which authorities he has instituted may not obey him. We obey them anyway because they are accountable to God. We don't always see how God is using an individual, but we recognize that God's authority is behind them. We're starting to wrap up, folks, I promise. In Luke 9, 48, Jesus told them, whoever receives and accepts and welcomes this child in my name and for my sake receives and accepts and welcomes me. And whoever so received me, receives me also receives him who sent me. For he who is least and lowliest among you all, he is the one who is truly great. Luke ten sixteen, Jesus says, He who hears and heeds you disciples, hears and heeds me. And he who slights and rejects you, slights and rejects me. And he who slights and rejects me, slights and rejects, rejects him who sent me. It's almost a communitive property. Jesus uses little children fearlessly in the same way that he uses you and me. The Jews were different. They were skeptics who couldn't logically understand why Jesus, and let alone God the Father, who he represented and claimed to represent in his earthly ministry, would use these ordinary people to do his will. But God stands behind those to whom he has delegated authority, and he will even allow himself to be restrained by the authority that he has delegated. Now we're getting into a deep thing here, and this can be kind of hard to understand, but God won't ever do what you won't let him. 
Think about the preachers and teachers that God has instituted in the body throughout all of time, and even today, who don't happen to believe in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, who don't believe in other biblically supported theology. I love a story pastor tells about there was, there was a meeting of pastors going on, there was a service happening, and the piano player fell out in the spirit. And the piano kept playing. And after the service, when the speaker had told that story, a man came up to him and he said, well, I don't believe that that's how that would have happened. I don't believe that that, that that piano would keep playing. And the speaker looked at him and he said, well, then it's never going to happen for you. Because God will stay in the box you put him in. That's why we're constantly given evidence about how much bigger and more powerful God is than we can even understand. So that we don't put God inside a box. I made light of this, but if God is going to be obedient to those he has put in authority, how are you and I going to be rebellious to those same people? Did I step on a toe and I didn't know it? Okay. Oh, well, I didn't hear it, but thank you for pointing out to me that your phone went off. I appreciate it. Okay. Okay. (laughs) Oh, I love this service. He who hears and heeds you, disciples, hears and heeds me. He who slights and rejects you, slights and rejects me. And he who slights and rejects me, rejects him who sent me. This is a beautiful illustration of how authority works. I, to make an example of myself, I promise I do not mean this to gloat because it embarrasses me to be the center of attention, believe it or not. I, as you all know, was recently ordained. And pastor has trusted me with preaching the Thursday night service. I represent pastor, pastor represents Jesus, and Jesus represents God. It's that quick walk up the ladder. I'm not saying that to be seen as a dictator. It's simply the position that I've been put in. And to be rather honest, it makes me watch what I do all the closer because I am held more responsible. As we wrap this up, we're going to look at the lone example in the New Testament where Peter and Paul were disobedient to delegated authorities, but they remained submitted to their authority. Acts 5.29, Peter and the apostles replied, we must obey God rather than men. They were told to stop preaching the gospel by Roman centurions or Roman guards, people who were in positions of civil authority and to whom they were meant to submit. And so they did, because submission is the attitude and obedience is the action. But they were told to stop preaching the gospel, which directly goes against God's word and God's will, so they disobeyed without being rebellious. Had to give the, huh? Obedience is the action. Submission is the attitude. Because the action that Peter took was disobedient. He did not do what someone in authority had told him to do. But his attitude stayed under their authority the way in which he was disobedient remained submissive. It recognized that they were in authority. Not to say, well, I'm not doing that because that goes against what God said. But to say, I'm, I'm very sorry. I know you're doing your job. But I can't do that. I have to obey God. I can't obey you in this instance. Entirely disobedient. Insubordinate's another fun word for it. 
but they remain submissive. Next week, I can't remember what we're going to talk about. I thought I could for a moment, and then I didn't. But I hope and, and pray that this series has been illuminating, that it has helped, gain, helped each of us gain a greater understanding of how authority is absolutely everywhere and how we are called to respond to that same authority. I'm going to go ahead and close in prayer. If anyone has something they would like specific prayer for, I will stay up here for a little bit before Jonathan says that there is a money plate back there. I assume if people want to give tens of thousands of dollars, we can get you a receipt tonight. What if you, yes, ma'am. Of course. Father, thank you so much for the time that we have had this evening. We thank you, Lord, for your word, your truth, your justice, your mercy. And Father, we thank you that this word goes deep into our hearts and that it changes us and affects us because we are doers of the word, not hearers only. We thank you, Father, that while this panic of disease is going on, Father, that you would heal those who have been affected and that your peace and hope and joy would permeate the hearts of those who have not been affected but are anxious about it. Father, we thank you for healing throughout the body because we know that when one part of the body hurts, the whole body suffers. Thank you for getting us safely here tonight. Thank you for getting us safely home and bringing us safely back. Father, help us to look more like you in all that we say and do and act and think. We pray these things in the name of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.